Hello and thank you for tuning in to the Weird, Wacky and Wonderful Stories podcast. Now, please welcome, all the way from their front living room, your hosts, Shelley and Bella. Hey everybody and welcome to episode 39 of the Weird, Wacky and Wonderful Stories podcast. Hi everybody. How are you doing? Now you've got your little puppy in your hands. This is our guest. Well, she's not a guest speaker. She's She's a a witness. She's a guest peer. (laughs) She pees absolutely everywhere on cue. Oh, but she's adorable. And she is ready to hear about some ghost stories. Well, I'm glad about that because today we've got with us Mark Rees, who has actually interviewed a lot of well-known faces in this sort of paranormal genre, including the cast of The Most Haunted and Celebrity Psychic Mediums, as well as researching guides to the most haunted places in Wales, the country's famous ghosts, and an annual ghost hunt which is published every October. He's been invited to speak on the subject of the paranormal on several occasions. Please welcome to the show fellow Welshman. Mark Rees. Hello, good morning. Good morning, Charlie. Good morning, Bella. Hello. Hello. How are you doing? Very good. Very good. Thank you. Excellent job. Okay, we are really, really interested in the book that you've written, The Ghosts of Wales, Accounts from the Victorian Archives. But before we get into that, I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about yourself. I've spent a long part of my life working as a journalist. So I specialise in the arts, but one of the one of the perks of being a journalist is that you do get to do some unusual things that, you know, people on the street can't usually do. And over my sort of my career, my sort of nearly 20 years now, I've been able to visit so-called haunted houses and go to some strange cursed places and things in in the name of journalism but as a result i've been able to collect them together into into books one of which is is the ghosts of wales books that you've mentioned which is keeping me very very busy now so i've spent the, all of the halloween period traipsing about the place doing events and talks and then tv and radio and things talking about the ghosts yeah I've very much become the 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 ghost man of my little part of wales now <laughs> <laughs> there's not a better time really is there to release and to obviously publicize a book around the halloween area yes Yes, well, <laughs> what I do like about doing this now, actually, is because Halloween is just gone. And usually, you know, I, I'm Mr. Poplar up until October the 31st. And then <laughs> November the 1st, nobody cares again for another year. But <laughs> this, this is quite nice for me to actually be talking about ghosts in November, you know, because there, there is there is a demand for it after the, the spooky period is over, you know, and, and I, can, I can keep it going this way. Exactly. We started this podcast off originally just wanting to really discuss weird, wacky and wonderful stories. So it could be someone phoning up saying we want to discuss an embarrassing situation that we had or a friend of ours has got over some crazy illness or whatever and, you know, are inspiring to people. That's the kind of thing that we originally envisaged this podcast was going to be all about. It was going to be an uplifting podcast that anyone could listen to irrespective of what your beliefs or whatever are. What's actually happened is that, as you rightly said, there are people that are interested in this all year round. Yes, well, well, I, I, I'm, a, I'm a good example of that. I mean, I won't, I'll keep my embarrassing stories to myself. But the ghost <laughs> ones I'll be, uh, I'll be talking about. And yes, I mean, there are, there are some great lines. If you look on, on social media, on Twitter, there are people who say that, you know, Halloween isn't a day, Halloween is a lifestyle, which uh, yeah, I quite got along with that. You know, I, I'll quite happily leave the odd ghost and the odd jack-o'-lantern up in the house uh, throughout the rest of the year as well. But yes, yes, I, I think some people are just drawn, aren't they, naturally to the, the, the weirder, the more gothic side of life. You know, the, the, the films that I watch, I watch a lot of horror films, I read a lot of, of gothic novels, and that's that's just my interest, not just for October. So did you always have sort of an interest in this? Or like you said, you were traveling and going to all these other places, and is that when that developed for you, or is it just something you've always been interested in? It's a bit of both. I mean, I grew up in the 1980s, and I think one of the, the best things of that is sort of the, the very influential films like Ghostbusters and Gremlins come out around then, yeah. which I think have left a lasting impression on a lot of people now, sort of in their sort of 30s, 40s, going on to that sort of age now. And even though, you know, that, that's fiction, I think when you get drawn into that at a young age and reading things like Dracula, the, the older you get, maybe you look at things in a, in a slightly different way. But that, that sort of magical feel that comes with these ghost stories will, will I, I assume, will stay with me for the rest of my life now. Yeah, they don't make horror movies like they used to, do they? <laughs> no, no, no. I mean, well, they, they, they try to, don't they? They try yeah. and, and rehash these things, but maybe it's nostalgia, I don't know. I think the comics and the films and the books of my childhood have, have definitely led me to my interests uh, in later life. I think that aside of like the Freddy and all of those sort of horror movies, which obviously were out for shock value, when you mention things like Ghostbusters, they were kind of almost done tongue-in-cheek weren't they you know and I think Steven Spielberg had a run 
return of some amazing films during that era. So I'm totally with you on that. That those sort of I don't I don't like to say retro because it just makes me sound old. But <laughs> yeah. those, those kind yeah. of retro type films and and all that sort of stuff, I think, harken back to a, a much nicer day. They do, and and even I mean, you mentioned things like like Freddy there, you know, which, which was scary at the time, but it, it was scary. But there was there was a humour to it as well, and there wasn't. I'm not a big fan of the sort of the modern day extreme horror things, you know, that, that doesn't do anything for me. You know, I, I like that to be, it sounds silly saying it, but a sort of a warmness to some of these horror films. Well, there's horrible things happening, but it's mm. still in a, in, in a fun way. Yeah. You are from Wales or you are living in Wales at the minute. I detect a slight other accent. <laughs> do you like, know, I get that a lot. I get that. I get people assuming I'm Irish, Australian, New Zealand, but no, I, I'm 100% Welsh, 100% Port Albert, uh, to be precise. And uh, w- weirdly with the accent, I, I was actually in Welsh education. So, you know, I speak the Welsh language as well. <laughs> That's been nothing to, to stop people think that I'm not Welsh, but no, no, 100% Welsh. Right. Okay. Fair enough. I'm not Welsh. <laughs> <laughs> I thought maybe you hide it as well as me then. <laughs> yeah. One thing that we were talking about the media then and some of the films that obviously have come from our past there. What I like about your book is that you discuss or you illustrate some of the stories that were actually in the newspapers back in the Victorian era. So these are real stories that happened to real people and then were actually publicised in the media. Can you tell us a little bit about some of the stories that you worked with? Yes, I mean, you've touched on the key thing there. For every single story that I included is reported as fact. So that, that's not to say they, they are all true. I mean, some of them are quite ridiculous looking back at them now. But at the time, they were reported in the press as being 100% true. And so I worked almost like a spooky detective where I was going back through all the old newspapers, magazines, periodicals I could get. In some cases, there were there were police reports and court cases I looked into to, to piece together all the facts I could find from the period to, to see what people were reporting at the time. Uh, the end result was, of course, the book then, Ghost of Wales Accounts in the Victorian Archives. But I'll be honest, I never, when I set out doing this, expected to find enough good stories for a book. My original intention was to write a nice newspaper article, to find four or five good stories, to write a nice two-page spread. But they just kept coming. You know, I was hoping to find four stories and I ended up with 400. That is when I approached my publisher and said, look, I've stumbled across what what I think is something quite interesting here, which no one else has touched upon. All these long lost real life ghost stories, would you be interested in publishing them? And, And luckily they said yes. You've written other books on Wales. You're keeping it in the vein of Wales, which is good because I'm a Welshman myself and let's push Wales as much as we can. (laughs) Oh yes, I'm doing that. Can you give us some ideas of some of the stories that you were talking about? Uh, Well, one of my favourite stories from the Wild Wales section of the book took place in Abbasachan, which is a a village not far from Pontypool. Know it well? Oh, excellent, excellent. Well, in that case, you might know this, uh, (laughs) where I'm about to talk about the ghost then. But Abbasachan was being terrorised by what the press called the two-headed phantom. The two-headed phantom of Abbasachan. If you know it well, you might be able to help me with this, because it was said to be hunting in the vicinity of a pub called the Blue Boar Inn, which by all accounts is still there. It, it might have had a, you know, a lick of paint and a change of landlord over the years, but by all accounts, the Blue Boar Inn, the building, is still there. And people reported seeing this this strange black silhouette, this ghostly figure, which had two heads, which which, which is very unique. I mean, there are a lot, a lot of stories out there of ghosts with, with no heads and ghosts carrying their heads, but ghosts with two heads are, are very unique. I don't know of any others in in Wales mm. with two. And the, the best first-hand account we have of the ghost comes from a man called Dan Hartley, because at the time, people were so scared of this ghost. The Certainly the women and children, it's always the women and children, isn't it? But the women and children <laughs> wouldn't leave the house after dark because it was too terrifying for them. The men would only go out if an urgent necessity compelled them. So that would be a family emergency or something that would force them to go out. Going to the pub didn't count as an emergency, so this was not good for the landlord's business, having this ghost running around the pub or outside the pub. But this man, as I said, Dan Hartley, was working in a nearby village, and for whatever reason, he was delayed going home. As he was walking back through the forest on his way back to Abasaka, night fell, and he was faced with a decision. He could persevere, he could keep going, but he might run the risk of coming face-to-face with this two-headed phantom of Abasaka. Or he could try and find a nice spot in the forest to sort of curl up and sleep there for the night, which didn't really appeal to him. So luckily for us, Dan kept going. Uh, unluckily for Dan, of course, because he did come face to face with the two-headed phantom of Abasaka. And w- when he saw this figure, he- he's, this is the-, the closest account we have of someone actually coming face to face. He screamed and screamed and he ran home as quickly as he could and he slammed the door, ran up to bed and, and somehow managed to get to sleep. Now, the next morning, he woke up feeling quite good considering what he'd been through and decided to go to work as, as normal. 
But it was while walking to work that day that it kind of, I, th I think sort of what, what had happened really struck him. He felt a bit faint and he collapsed on the floor in a heap. Luckily, one of his colleagues was coming behind him and he found him lying on the floor. So he helped him up, carried him back to his home. But Dan was, was convinced that after seeing this ghost, th that was the end. He was going to die. So much so, he started dictating his will to his friend. And it's quite interesting, sort of off topic of ghosts slightly, but it's quite interesting what he thought was important for his will at the time. He said, you know, I want my tobacco to go to so-and-so. <laughs> I want my pipe to go to so-and-so. And his, his most treasured possession was a little portrait he had of his, of his sweetheart that he wanted to go to someone else. Uh, luckily for Dan, Dan did survive a bit longer. He, he came through that period. But when the journalist went back a month later to talk to him again, Dan said, look, well, I'm paraphrasing slightly in Victorian speak, but he said, you know, I, I don't believe in any of this rubbish. I don't believe in ghosts. I don't believe in spirits. But I know what I saw that night, and I don't ever want to see that ever again. This is a total non-believer, but in this one instance, he was convinced he'd seen the two-headed phantom of Abbasakan. What I, what I love about this story in particular, though, is that the locals had a theory on who this ghost might be, because... Not long before these ghost sightings appeared, a man had died very near the pub, who did fit the description slightly. Now, this man was a member of the Catholic faith, and for, for reasons that I couldn't find in the archive, but he, he turned his back on the church and he left. He wasn't kicked out, he wasn't excommunicated, but he did leave the church. And so when he died, he couldn't go up to heaven because he was no longer a part of the church. But at the same time, he didn't go to hell because he wasn't a bad person. You know, he hadn't done anything terrible, but he, but he had left the church. And, and as a result, he was stuck in limbo, wandering around Abbasachan until, well, until eternity, I assume, however long these things take, which explains who the ghost was, but doesn't explain the two heads, because this man in life had one head. Uh, and this, this is, as most people do, yeah. but this is the, the, the most, like as I said, the goriest part of the book. But this man died at home one night. He was walking around his landing and he slipped and he fell down his stairs. He fell head first and landed with a crack at the bottom with such a force that when he hit the bottom, that stone floor, his head was actually cracked through the skull in two. And this ghost is believed to have been not a ghost with two heads, but the ghost of a man with one head, which was hanging open, flapping in two separate parts, which is quite a, a gruesome wow. image if you, if you stop and think about it. Yeah. That is a, a good example of the kind of stories that were taking part in, in, in wild whales outside in the Victorian period. Uh, there's a lot to take from that. <laughs> yes. One thing that struck me there was that you were saying that a journalist actually approached him and asked him about it. And obviously that's what you've done today because obviously you've got an interest in this kind of story. Why do you think this kind of story really only makes maybe local news at best these days? It's quite interesting that comparing, as you said, sort of what, why it's only local news nowadays. But in the Victorian period, the journalists did not believe in ghosts at all. They were very cynical and they could make that clear in their copy. They, they would, I'm not exaggerating, they would say things like a bunch of idiots have seen, I <laughs> think they've seen a ghost. <laughs> really? you know, they, they, they didn't beat around the bush. But the big but is that at the time, ghost stories was selling papers, much like, you know, sort of celebrity scandals do now. Ghost stories back then were, were headline news on the front page. And if there was a ghost story anywhere in the UK, anywhere in the world in some cases, it would get picked up by the Victorian papers and reported on. And so you have this weird, this weird mixture of journalists almost being forced to write about something they hate writing about, but having to do it for the sake of, of selling papers, I assume. But it was very sensational at the time, very, very topical of the period. Ghost stories were very in vogue. This, I mean, this is when Charles Dickens wrote A Christmas Carol, arguably, you know, the biggest ghost story ever written. Edgar Allan Poe on the other side of the pond, you know, was writing some of the best horror stories ever written. Again, writing them direct for sort of publications like newspapers. So, you know, it, it was very much an in vogue, very cool thing at the time. People loved reading about ghost stories. And they still do, don't don't they? I hope they do. I hope they've allowed my book to read some, yes. <laughs> but I think the newspapers now, that they can't have the same cynical tone as before. But I, I think interests have just shifted on what sells papers, you know. I mean, in the Victorian time, you didn't really have political scandals that you might have now, which might fill the front pages. And and it's it's changing times. But I, I think there is definitely still an interest there with the public. Yeah, we've been absolutely inundated. And this podcast has just blown up. We just can't get over how much interest has come from, as I say, something that we didn't initially necessarily want to go down the paranormal route. It just kind of, it's evolved into that through our listeners. So yeah, there definitely is an interest these days. 
And I think to a certain degree, uh, certainly the national papers are missing a trick, really. I don't think that you should take every case and say, oh, that's, you know, that's definitely true. I think there needs to be some sensible investigation and some sensible behaviour around the whole topic. But I definitely think that they're missing a trick. Yes, and I, th I think, I mean, I mean the, the, the nature of the media has changed as well now. And I think now if somebody says they've seen a ghost, people go, yeah, yeah, whatever, and that's it. But the, the stories that the, the press do seem to leap on now are the ones which have some kind of sort of audio or visual proof, if you can call it proof, of what's going on. So if somebody does claim to capture a video showing a ghost moving things around, that, that is the kind of story now that the, you know, the, the press would love to put on their website. But it has to be a bit more than just you know, somebody claiming they saw it. People like evidence now, I think, so you need something to back it up with. Yeah. The back of your book, it says on there that there's 50 hair-raising and sometimes comical real-life accounts. Can you share a comical one with us? <laughs> I'm glad you asked that because my, my favourite story in the entire book is, is a comical one. And, and the reason I love this story so much is that when I first pitched the idea of this book to my publisher, my exact words to them were that some of the stories that I've found in the archives sound like the plot from an episode of a Scooby-Doo cartoon. And... <laughs> What I what what I meant by that is that there were you know there were criminals and there were there were kids and there were people at the time messing around pretending to be ghosts. And I didn't literally mean there was a gang of pesky kids in a you know in a sixties sixties camper van driving around with a dog pulling masks off people. But what what I meant was is that some of the criminals or some of the you know just just kids messing around were often caught out in quite comical ways when they were pretending to be ghosts. And I found this story which takes place in a, a little village called Rosset, which is up in North Wales, part of part of Wrexham County council now right on the border with england and rosset was being terrorized by a ghost but the problem they had in rosset was that there was no outdoor lighting at the time you know back in the 19th century which meant this ghost could pop up scare people and just disappear into the darkness before they had any chance of doing anything about it but the locals were getting wise to this and at night when they were out and about in the dark they were keeping their wits about them in case this ghost popped up again one night the ghost decides to scare a man who's cycling home on his bike and the ghost pops up and goes, boo. Well, I, I don't know if it says boo, but it pops up. Absolutely, <laughs> boo. <laughs> it's, it's, with a podcast, you need something to illustrate the ghost with something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, so the ghost says it. boo. <laughs> and, and the man falls off his bike. The man is red and pulls out a gun and shoots a bullet at the ghost, which sounds quite remarkable nowadays, but there are, there are cases from this period where people really did shoot ghosts with guns. Luckily in Wales, they ended... They didn't end tragically. There are there are cases in England and, and elsewhere where, whether it's mistaken identity or whatever reason, but ghosts really did get hit by bullets. And if they you know, if they weren't dead beforehand, they certainly were afterwards. <laughs> but in, in this case, the bullet did miss the ghost. And the ghost did its usual trick of running off into the darkness. But there was another man also keeping his wits about him, looking out for this ghost. And he had a dog with him. And when the dog heard all this, this kerfuffling and shooting and people falling off bikes... The dog chased off into the darkness after this ghost. And the first inclination the people of Rosset had that this ghost wasn't really a ghost is when the dog bit the ghost's leg and the ghost went ow and <laughs> fell to the ground, which meant that the dog could rip the white sheet off the ghost uh, and unveil in the villain. Uh, underneath, who was then apprehended by, by the police or the authorities. And, and the reason I love that so much, you know, I punched the air when I found that story, it is because after telling my publisher they did sound like the plot from a Scooby-Doo cartoon, I did actually find my very own real-life Scooby-Doo dog who was <laughs> alive and well in Wales, had the ghosts in the 19th century. I wonder if they gave him a Scooby snack after he caught him. I, I used to have a lot of Scooby snacks after that, shouldn't <laughs> he? Yes, yes. Oh, that's got to be the name of this podcast, hasn't it? Sco Scooby Snacks. The real Scooby-Doo, yeah. <laughs> yes, the real Scooby-Doo. <laughs> that's amazing. Something a little bit more serious then. Um, you also state that in some cases, people were forced to flee their homes. They were, they were. This is, again, this is very sort of unique to the Victorian period, but it's when the, the term poltergeist was first introduced into, into the English language. It's a combination of, of two German words, which means noisy ghost. But yes, poltergeists, again, you know, I, I don't want to say they, they were cool and popular, but this is when the term was introduced. And all of a sudden, things which in the past might have been, they might have been rats, it might have just been wind or rain coming through your roof or your ceiling, but they were suddenly becoming much more terrifying to a lot of people. And so poltergeist activity increased. In Wales, which, which is where I focus my attention, poltergeists seem to love farmyards for some reason. 
But anyone living sort of remotely without any neighbours around them were a favourite target. And I, I made a little collection of, the, I, I had so many that I made a little poltergeists on farms part of the book. Mm. As well as scaring people, one of the sort of more popular things was damaging their property and, and damaging their, their livelihood. So they would, they'd say they'd churn the milk, so the milk was then unusable. They'd scare the animals. And in some cases, there were animals stolen, relocated to other farms, other part of the country, which... If you're cynical, you could say maybe it's just rival farmers attacking each other and yeah, playing wrestling. tricks. Yeah. But yes, certainly that there was a huge increase in, in poltergeist activity or so-called poltergeist activity at the time. It's amazing how superstitious people are in that people are always, oh, no, I'm not superstitious. But I mean, you know, if you go outside and your cow's missing. And yes. Yeah, they say, I'm not superstitious. Touch wood, nothing's ever happened. <laughs> <Yeah>. Yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> It is. It's nobody's superstitious until it's happening to them, isn't it? And then, then all of a sudden, mm -hmm. the doubt creeps in, doesn't it? And again, you know, I mean, you mentioned superstition. There are reports, even though the the old sort of folklore tales were dying out at this time, and stories of, of goblins and fairies, Tully's Tig and things. There are still people in the nineteenth century reporting corpse candles and all all these sort of terrible old things from the old days, which would have scared people. So it never quite went away, and even still, still lingers to this day in some extent. Have you yourself ever experienced anything that you would term as unexplained or supernatural or anything like that? Yes and no. Again, you know, sort of in my, in my role as a journalist and as someone with an interest in this, I've been on a lot of ghost hunts, paranormal investigations, whatever you want to call them, with lots of different groups, lots of different people. And I, I've seen things that I, that I can't explain, but I haven't seen anything to convince me that, yes, that is paranormal, or yes, that is the, the, the spirit of a dead person coming back to play tricks on us or anything. So, yes, I've experienced things, but nothing to make me a confirmed believer, if you, if you want to call it that. So the jury's still out as far as you're concerned? It, it is, and it's... I mean, people ask me all the time, you know, they assume because I write books about ghosts, I'm, I must be a believer in ghosts. But to me, the, the most interesting thing is the stories. You know, I love the stories. A lot like the story I just told you about the Scooby-Doo dog, you know, that, 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 it doesn't matter if you believe in ghosts or not. It's still, a, it's a cool story. It's a fantastic story. That is the, the important thing as far as I'm concerned. Definitely. It's funny, actually, that we went out on sort of a ghost hunt, if you like, if you want to call it that, a couple of weeks ago. And we've never gone on anything like that before. And in fact, it wasn't something that we ever thought that we would be doing necessarily. But we were offered the opportunity to go out with a, a group that we previously interviewed on the podcast and it was quite interesting i didn't see anything that would confirm anything for me 100 percent either bella had an experience which was also experienced by another chap there at the same time which was quite interesting and something that we can't explain but what really struck us was some of the equipment that they were using which of course back in the victorian era they wouldn't have had but things like they call them rem pods isn't it which sort of detects something coming within a certain vicinity they've got these like xbox connect things that they use that can map out the room and detect things that are moving etc so they got some pretty awesome data if you like yes. back on some of these bits of equipment but again i want to be able to see it touch it feel it myself Yes, yes. And uh, it draws some very interesting parallels with the Victorian times again, which is when you, you could say the birth of ghost hunting was born. Because, I mean, before the Victorian times, ghosts were something that you ran away from rather than went looking for. There was a Victorian councillor called Henry White in Cardiff, in the Cathays uh, district of Cardiff. What I really like about Henry White is that at the time, as I was saying earlier about journalists being very sceptical about people who believe in ghosts and things, if, if a public figure, if a politician was thought to be a believer in ghosts, they, they were ridiculed and they were made fun of in the press. But a story came out that Henry White was a believer in ghosts. And the reason for this is that he was also a landlord. Being a politician, he had lots lots of money, lots of things going on. And and a young girl came to his house one day and asked to rent one of his properties. And Henry White went through the usual procedure of, you know, yes, you know, it'll cost this much, blah, 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 blah. But the last question is, how long have you been in your current place? And she said, two months. Uh, and this set off the alarm bells. And he thought, well, if you've only been there two months, why are you looking to move into one of my houses so quickly? And she said, well, you know, if you really want to know, it's because it's haunted. So Henry White said, well, if you say this house is haunted, let me come around, investigate myself. And if I agree with what you say, you can rent one of my properties. And Henry White went around and he was left believing, not necessarily that it was haunted, but there were strange things in that house that he couldn't explain. And as a result, you know, he, he let them rent one of his properties. This made its way into the press and the news broke that Henry White was one of these crazy, mad ghost people. 
Now, what I love about Henry White is that when the news broke, the usual thing a politician might do is try and kill the story and die it down. He went the opposite way. He, he invited the press to his house and he sat them down and he said, look, not only do I believe there was something strange going on, I want to go one step further. And he wanted to establish an ethical way that people should be hunting ghosts. And this is, as you said, long before all the, these fancy devices and TV shows and things that we have nowadays, back in the old days. And I just want to read very quickly his, his sort of closing remarks on how people should investigate ghosts as far as he was concerned. And he said, as a preliminary step, each of a party of friends associated with a common object should take one of these books. He suggests uh, some old books that people should sort of research the material first, thoroughly digest its contents and make notes upon it. Then a conference should be held, notes compared, views interchanged, and finally, it should be determined to pursue a course of systematic investigation, the whole thing to be followed up, if possible, to some real conclusion. And then the last bit, he says, the movement, of course, should be set on foot with the mutual compact or declaration that the whole of the investigations be thoroughly honest, conscientious, and honorable. So this is going back over 100 years ago, and I think what Henry White is saying is that people should research before they go off and do anything silly. They should talk about it, which again is one of my bugbears at the moment, is people like to, to keep all their experiences secret. No, share it, talk about it. And finally, finally, be honest, conscientious, and honorable. And I think, you know, yes, they can invent all these, these expensive new devices and things, but really it comes down to, to research, being honest and open with each other. And that is the way ghost hunting, I think, should still be done today. I've got to say, I'll wholeheartedly agree. I like the language that he's using there as well. So honest and honorable, you know, that's yes. classic Victorian language, isn't it? It's very, very stiff up my lip, <laughs> Victorian. <laughs> yeah. uh, th this yeah. is how we do things, yes. Yeah. So once he had taken the journalists to that location and obviously submitted that statement that you just read, was there any further sort of investigations or, you know, was there any kind of group sort of started that you're aware of or anything like that to follow his mantra? I, I didn't dwell too much on this because it's not sort of specific to Wales, but this is the time when the SPR, I don't know if you're familiar with, but the uh, Society of Psychical Research were established. They still are the most, the most sort of prominent people in, in search of the truth. And not not just with Henry White, but with sort of other people across across Wales and across the UK, this this movement did begin. I mean, a lot of what they investigated then is is a bit different now because spiritualism was pretty much at its peak, and so they spent a lot of time investigating and sort of testing people who claimed to have psychic abilities or people who claimed they could talk to the dead, these things that which went on in seances, a lot of which by the end of the 19th century were proven to be to be bogus and a lot of these, these so-called mediums were, were taken to court, they were proven to be misleading people and put out of business. But yes, I mean, th th this is very much the start of it. I just think the nature of what we go in search of now has changed. People now might spend the night in a stately home, whereas back then they might have spent it in a, in a seance parlour watching the psychic mediums at work. It's funny because I was reading an article the other day and it was talking about these paranormal investigators at the moment where they will actually go into a location and the first thing they do is turn off all the lights. And it was quite interesting actually in this article, it says that, well, you've got people seeing ghosts at all times of the day and really is turning the lights out helping you to detect them or is it, you know, you're trying to create this environment that's actually spooky which doesn't necessarily lend itself to seeing the ghost. So really, you're not being proactive at all. Leave the lights on and you might see something. And I thought that was quite a good idea, personally. One of the groups I'm, I'm friendly with called Cymru Paranormal, who are a lovely bunch, and that's one of the things they say is that you should recreate the, the, the scene exactly as it was reported. And if somebody said they saw it at two in the afternoon with the lights on, then you go ghost hunting at two in the afternoon with the lights on, not at two in the morning where it's pitch black. But I think it, it, it all depends on what you want from the experience. Some people are looking for scientific proof of an existence or of life after death or whatever it might be. Other people want a good time. Some people, they just want to go out with their friends in the dark, be scared, a bit like, you know, you might go on a ghost train for. And yeah. I think as long as you're, you're honest beforehand of what you're going out for and what, what you hope to achieve, I have no problem with either way. But don't, don't pretend sitting in the room at two in the morning in the dark is scientific when there are better ways to be doing it. Yes. Yeah, I think it's a shame too because there are some paranormal groups that are out there that really do want the truth. But then you've got a lot of these shows on TV now and it's all about 
just trying to get people to watch the show. And it does, I think, give a bad name to the whole topic. Uh, unfortunately, I can't remember who I stole this quote from, but it was at an ASAP convention. But they said that the one thing all ghost hunters know is that what happens at a ghost hunt is nothing. And that is true. You, you can spend all night there. And if you're lucky, you might get a strange sound. You might get the odd picture. You might get the odd feeling. But you will not get anywhere near enough to fill an hour's worth of television from that ghost exactly. hunt. Exactly. And yeah. to do that on demand for, what, 12 episodes a series, <laughs> eight series, whatever year, that is why people get skeptical. Because when they do it for themselves, they say, well, well I've sat in this, this haunted place all weekend and I've seen nothing. Whereas this television crew went there for half an hour uh, and, and there were tables flying in the air and knives, you know, <laughs> being thrown at my head. So that, that is why I think people are a bit skeptical of these things. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And in fact, we were speaking with Marie D. Jones a couple of weeks ago and she said something similar. She works on Ancient Aliens and a couple of other shows like that. And she said that, you know, they will very often take bits of information off of you get they'll sit you down in a room and interview you for several hours and then just take little sound bites from you and insert them into the show in place sometimes to make it look like you've agreed with something that you never agreed with in the first place it's taken out of context so yeah i think a lot of the media is chasing the ratings rather than actually chasing the truth i think I think as long as you, you realize that, I don't have a problem with that. I mean, if you watch Most Haunted now, it says right at the start, this is purely for entertainment purposes. We, we all know that. We all, we've all seen that in big letters at the start. Great. And then, you know, I, I can sit there and I can thoroughly enjoy it. But I've seen that thing at the start, you know, and just like, I don't know if you saw the Inside Number 9 Halloween special that was on in the week, which was very similar to Ghost Watch. Do you remember, I don't know if you remember Ghost Watch on the BBC about 20 years ago, where these programs are done where you, you know they're fake, but they're still done in such a way to trick the audience into thinking something weird and something spooky is happening. And, yeah. and they're thoroughly enjoyable. Just don't take them as being, you know, as, as fact. Don't take them too seriously. Yeah. yeah. Did you learn anything that shocked you, that totally shocked you, came out of the blue when you were researching this book? The biggest shock, which isn't a spooky shock, but is just the sheer volume of ghost stories, which nobody had looked at in so long. You know, as I mentioned, I was hoping to find a couple of good stories. To find hundreds, literally hundreds of reports, which, which nobody ha has touched upon in so long. You know, I, I was just amazed. I couldn't believe nobody else thought of, of doing this before. You know, it, it's just there is so much out there. And what that means is, is that th this is only a short period of time. This is just the Victorian period. If nobody has looked at any of these reports, then that suggests there are a lot of other reports out there from before and from after, which, which I'll be sort of delving into. And yes, I, and just from a Welsh point of view, be, being the patriotic Welshman again, but people think of Victorian ghosts and they do think of smoky Victorian London of sort of this sort of Jack the Ripper landscape. Nobody yeah, yeah. really thinks of, of Wales at all when it comes to the Victorian age, because this is, you know, as, as I mentioned, it's been ignored for so long. But there are lots of really good stories out there. There are, like I mentioned about the two-headed phantom of Abbasaka and some, some very unique stories out there, which I don't think are replicated in other places. And so, yeah, it, the, the, the biggest shock was also a, you know, a very pleasant surprise that there were so much hidden stories out there. So do you think there's going to be a volume two? Definitely, yes. Oh, excellent. <laughs> yes, that was, the, that was the easy question. <laughs> I'm, I'm actually working on, this is a bit of an exclusive, actually, because this hasn't, this hasn't been announced yet. But in next spring, I've got a book coming out, which is called The A to Z of Curious Whales which is not just ghosts, but it's looking at weird and wonderful things from curses to UFOs and all very similar to the subject of your podcast, I guess, but lots of yeah. weird and wonderful things, which is coming out next spring. In that book, there are a handful of ghost stories, which I've been working on for the sequel of Ghosts of Wales, which, fingers crossed, all being well, will be out in time for next Halloween. But there will definitely be the book of curiosities out in the spring, which will have a few new ghost stories in, and then watch this space for, for part two. I'm very lucky, I'm very grateful people have bought the first one, because that has, that has allowed me to pitch a second, a third, a fourth one, and we'll see how it goes. Yeah, I could be sitting here as an old man writing volume 20, I don't know, but <laughs> uh, really, as long as people are, are kind enough to buy the book that then allows me to to write another one so long may it continue yeah definitely out of the stories that you've read you you mentioned the one that was probably your favorite which was the scooby-doo one mm -hmm. have you got another one that springs to mind straight away this is a bit of a dvd extra actually because this one didn't make it into the book so it is it is nice to tell people this one as if they've read the book they won't be familiar with this one the only downside is it, it is like the Scooby-Doo one. It's another hoax story. Uh, and that, that is one of the, the unfortunate things is that a lot of the best stories from this period are the ones that turn out to be in no way paranormal. 
But this takes place in Swansea, specifically in Mount Pleasant area. And, and if anyone knows Mount Pleasant, it's, there's this big, huge hill, which actually it, it features at the start of the film Twin Town. If anyone's seen Twin Town, it's that big hill at the start. But there was a man in bed one night and a noise disturbed him. He woke up and he found a burglar next to his bed rummaging through his personal belongings. But this burglar had a white sheet over him disguised as a ghost. And the man saw this, this burglar next to his bed and he said, what are you doing? And the burglar, I, I can't do the hand movements on voice only with this, but the burglar says, ooh, I'm a ghost. <laughs> and the man says, w w what do you want? And the burglar says, ooh, I'm, uh, I'm here to show you your fortune. And, and the most remarkable thing about this story it isn't the fact that there's a burglar dressed as a ghost, but it's the fact that the man believes him. <laughs> and this, it, it says a lot, really, about Victorian beliefs at the time. That I, I, I won't go into this into this too deeply now, but for for a lot of people, they assumed ghosts were not just things that turned up to scare you, like in a Hollywood movie nowadays. But they had some useful purpose. They were there to give you a message, you know, maybe, maybe like a saint, but something. You know, if you look at the ghosts in A Christmas Carol with Scrooge, you know, they, yeah, they, they, they say, terrify that's him. Kind of what they were going yes. on, yeah. But, but they have, I'm sure Scrooge would be the first to admit, as terrible as that was, it was a good thing. You know, at the end of it, he was a, a better person. He saved his soul and, and, and all that. So this man found this ghost next to his bed. The ghost said, I'm here to show you your fortune. And so the man said, oh, OK, wh wh where is my fortune? And the ghost said, follow me. Or the burglar said, follow me. And led the man into his garden. So the ghost pointed at a particular spot and said, if you dig there, you will find your gold. So the man picks up a shovel, starts digging in the spot. And when the man's back is turned, the burglar thinks, right, this would be a good time to leg it. So he jumps <laughs> over the fence and he runs off towards the top of Constitution Hill now in Mount Pleasant. The man who's digging turns around and the, the light bulb above the head moment is when you can see this burglar running and you can see the white sheet. But at the bottom of the white sheet is a pair of dirty workman's boots. And he thinks, hang on, ghosts don't wear boots. <laughs> At which point he chases after him and it's, it's quite easy for the man to catch him because this burglar is dressed as a ghost. So he catches him quite quickly. Uh, they have a bit of a wrestling match and uh, ironically the police turn up and arrest the man for beating up a ghost after all of this. <laughs> Again, I, I found this from reading through the, the, the court cases at the time because it did go to court where the man had to defend it and say, you know, I, I believed him to a point. But, but I love that. And as I said, the reason, the reason that was cut from the book is that I wanted this book to be mainly about cases which could be paranormal. I included a small section on hoaxes. As I said, it's, it's broken up into eight sections. One of those is hoaxes. The other seven are stories which are presumably unexplained, potentially paranormal in nature. And so I had to drop that as well as, well as lots of other hoaxes that I liked purely to keep the, the book about ghosts rather than about stupid humans pretending to be ghosts. <laughs> I think that's a cracking story, though. I really do. The fact that you said, you know, well, hang on a minute, ghosts don't wear boots. They wear sheets. You know, <laughs> yes, they don't exactly. Wear, yeah. They don't wear boots. <laughs> yeah. How did he get on in court? Did you ever find out what the outcome of that was? The burglar d did not go to prison, if that's what you mean. No, th they both pretty much accepted that he was stupid to go along with it, but that man shouldn't have been in the house. But he had caused grievous bodily harm, whatever it was. The end result was that the burglar did not did not go to prison for it, no. I would just love to have seen the charge sheet on that, you know. <laughs> exactly. I mean, this, this man, <laughs> I mean, there were people in court laughing at this man for believing it. So his case wasn't, wasn't that great. I think that talking about that these days, people don't tend to laugh as much at the paranormal now. You know, when you say that you have an experience now, you might get the odd person that kind of snubs their nose and says, well, you know, I don't really believe that. But they usually follow that with a statement that says, mind you, this one time... Yeah. You know, so I think that people's eyes have been opened a little bit to, to, to the whole sort of arena of the paranormal. And I include sort of UFOs and aliens and all that sort of stuff. I think people's minds are expanding now. How do you feel that the book has been received yourself with, with people that you've introduced it to? Yes, I mean, it's, it's interesting what you say there about people's minds, because if you ask someone, do you believe in ghosts? They'll say no. But then if you say, so you've got no stories, and they will say, well, actually, there was this one time. You know, this one yeah. time when I when I was eight and something woke me up, or last week when I was going to the car and I saw a strange light in the sky. But people, w when pressed, or when they're on their own, or when spoken to, it's amazing the stories that come out. And again, with my journalist hat on, that is one of the things I'm doing now, is I, I am keeping, you know, sort of a, a, a long list of stories that I'm picking up on my travels. But yes, yes, I think, and I, of course, I think the world has changed, and having... So things like social media and message groups that allow like-minded people across the world to, to communicate and share with each other 
is is a big part of that because whereas before you know when i was growing up if someone thought they saw a ufo they might be some weirdo on their own but if they can go on the internet and they can talk with 200 other people who've seen similar things around the world it's almost like a support group for people which which all all helps yeah but the the, re the real key thing for me and i touched upon this earlier with the ghosts is that people have to share and they have to talk to each other you know if people keep these things to themselves oh it's mine you know that, that doesn't do anyone any good you know share tell the world and, and who knows what might come out of it then exactly you'll always come across the crazies but very mm -hmm. often you'll come across that little nugget that'll make you think oh hang on a minute mm -hmm. it was funny actually because <laughs> i was listening to an interview the other day the guy was talking about these crazies that wear the hats you know to stop them from being attacked by aliens you know yeah. and they said you know they wearing these big metal hats he said they sell them on the internet you know they've got them on ebay he said and in fact he said they work he said because i don't know of anyone who's been wearing one of those hats that have been attacked by an alien <laughs> yes yeah, yeah. <laughs> I have to get myself on eBay, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. Just bringing this to a close, where can people get hold of this book? It's available in, it, it's it's a cliche, but in all good bookshops. Well, certainly in Wales, in all good bookshops. Internationally, it's, it, it's available in all the usual, I, I won't name drop them, but all the usual internet sites that sell these books. It, it, it's readily available, sort of out there. Excellent. And have you got a website yourself? Or? I'm much more of a social media person, and I'm at Review Wales on Twitter, Facebook group, and Instagram. But if anyone wants to track me down personally, it's markraceonline.com is the, the website. Excellent. Okay. And regarding the 8 to Z of Curious Wales mm -hmm. that you're going to be releasing in the spring, if you want to come back on and talk about that when you're doing that, because as you said earlier, that totally fits in with what we're about and what our listeners are about as well. That, that would be excellent. Yeah, I'd, I'd really appreciate that. It's something I'll be getting back to uh, to work on, actually, after this phone call. <laughs> I'll get that. My, my deadline is the end of this month. But yeah, that'll be in the shops in, in the spring. And yeah, it'd be great to come back and talk about it. Excellent. Well, we'll look forward to that. Mark, thank you very much. And listeners, check that out. That's Ghosts of Wales accounts from the Victorian archives. Excellent. Thank you very much. But that, that's flown by, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it has, yeah. Thank you very much, Mark. Really appreciate it. And really appreciate you giving us your time on a Saturday morning as well. No, and uh, so I, I really appreciate the opportunity. So thank you very much both. And I hope I'll, I'll spread the word when it's finished. And yes, thank you very much. Lovely. Good luck with everything you're doing. Yeah, thanks both. All the best. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Thank you. So, yeah, that was pretty cool. One of the things I love about doing this podcast is that my library is expanding so much because we get to read so many interesting books. And you, you, used to take you ages. You can actually read a book now and... Yeah, it's not because I'm a shit reader. I just want to get that out there, okay? It's because I fall asleep at reading. I, I just, as a kid, I always used reading as a tool to get me to sleep. And now I read... Now fall asleep. Yeah, see, I always was the opposite. I would get my hands on a book and then I'd be under the covers with a real flashlight, not a phone, trying to not get caught reading. Some of those stories actually were really good. I love the one about the guy chasing the ghost down the street. That was just fantastic. I can picture that in my head. And he got arrested for beating up a ghost. <laughs> That's even better. I, I can picture it in an actual Scooby-Doo cartoon, though, because... That's always what would happen at the end. They would unmask the villain or the ghost, and then the police would always take them away. Yeah, so actually both of those <laughs> stories, the one with the Scooby story and that one, were both Scooby-esque, weren't they? So appropriate, it seems, how we have our new little bundle of joy here. Oh, uh, yes. <laughs> I hope it didn't scare her too much, you know. She is only a baby, having to listen to all these spooky ghost stories. Well, I hope she's not like the rest of our listeners, because she spent the whole of that asleep. I think she's good. <laughs> Anyway, guys, thank you very much for listening again, sharing your time with us. Please do tell people about the podcast. Share it in any way you can. Also, if you can rate us and like us, leave us a review if you can. If you do that and we see it, we will mention it on air for you. And uh, yeah, we greatly appreciate that. Plus, it'll just make us feel good, you know. Yeah, it makes us feel really good. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much, guys. We shall see you next time. Don't forget, stay, stay weird, weird, wacky, and, and wonderful. wonderful.